Okay. So what was your life like before September 22nd? You said you were living the street life. Start there. I was living the street life. Yes, I was um I was engaging in criminal activity. I I did I, I call myself a petty drug dealer. I wasn't this big time drug dealer where I made a lot of money, but I made a little bit of money, enough money to survive, enough money to take care of my family and my kids, pay the bills. Um then my girlfriend she we ended up getting married and we now have been divorced um she was engaging in prostitution i was agreeing to that i never told her hey don't do this i kind of like stipulated to it it was something that we both understood so um sam what kind of drugs were you dealing uh it varied but mostly it was heroin and um, that was really it. Other drugs that I have dealt with before have been crack and cocaine. So talk about um, the day that you were arrested, September 22nd. How did that all go down? Okay, so September 22nd, as I remember it, it was a real kind of like just mope around day. I woke up really late and um, my then girlfriend, she had went to work, so I was at the house. So I ended up having a couple friends come over and we just was playing the video game. And uh, so I went outside to meet um, somebody and I really seen like police, like in unmarked cars driving around the house. So it kind of made me paranoid and I was, I really didn't understand it. Obviously, I was selling drugs at the time. So, um, so did you think that they could possibly be there to arrest you for the drugs? Um, it, that would have been a possibility. However, they wasn't looking at the house. They wasn't looking at me in any kind of way. They just, what I thought to be true, because there was one of my friends that lived two blocks uh, from me. I believe because they kept turning down that way uh, towards Dearborn that they was really gonna go raid his house. That's what I thought. So then what happened? They, uh, so, how did they go down? So I was low on cigarettes. So I asked my, my brother ended up coming over to buy some drugs from me. And then he, um, he, as he was leaving, I asked him, I said, hey, can you go down to the corner store and buy me a pack of cigarettes? He said, I'll run down there, but I don't want to come back in. He was like, just come down there with me. So I was like, well, all right, I'll run down there. I ain't got nothing to do. So I was going to get in the car. And as soon as I crossed the street on Spring Grove, then all of the unmarked cars, the U.S. Marshals and the, the detectives and the Toledo Police Department had uh, pulled out their guns and laid me down to arrest me. And you had no idea why? Absolutely not. When I uh, talked to, like, they was asking me questions, obviously, what's your name? You know, who are you? Why do you got all this money in your pocket? Um, at that moment, I had said to him because I had a warrant for one of my domestic violence charges that I pled to and I was put on probation for. At that moment, I was like, I got 30 days in jail. I really don't care to do the probation. When they catch me, I'll go do my 30 days and I'll be done with it. So at that moment, I asked the U.S. Marshal that was putting the handcuffs on me. I said, you guys really come and get people for misdemeanor domestic violence charges? And at that moment, he said, yeah. So I was mind boggled that he was coming to get me for a misdemeanor four. So when I was in the back of the, the Toledo police cruiser on my way to the county jail, I was trying to engage in with the officers and ask them um, what was I arrested for? And they said, <laughs> It's bigger than me. He said, if you don't know, you will real shortly. And they took me to the front of the jail instead of behind the jail into booking. So when they took me to the front of Lucas County um, 
two detectives, which I believe it was Kozak and Williams came out in their suits and I seen the stars on their badge. So I believe right then and there that it was the FBI. Um, couple months, well, I take that back. November of that, that past year, 2010, I was arrested for promoting prostitution and they never indicted me on the case at all. So what I thought in my mind was the FBI come and got me. And that's what I was being arrested for was the prostitution charge. Wow. So Johnny and Lisa were killed on Long Acre at, uh, at the Straub home. Have you ever been to the Straub home? I'd never been to the Straub home at all. And I told the detectives that when I was interviewed. Did you know Johnny and Lisa? I never met Johnny. I never met Lisa. I never um, knew anybody that knew them at all until after I was in the county jail and I got my first um, round of motion to discovery and found out that there was one person that knew them and knew us. Alexandra? Alexandra Kuzno, yes. How did you know her? Um, Victoria is my first son's mother. Um, she had a baby with another man by the name of Nate Popovich. Nate Popovich had two kids with Alexandria. So through growing up, childhood friends, um, she was from Oregon. We was from the east side. So when Nate ended up, they was boyfriend and girlfriend before she was even pregnant. They, she would come over and hang out with us and kind of like, you know, kick it. You know, we would smoke weed, things of that nature. Did she ever mention Johnny or Lisa to you? I never at all. You never heard that name? I never heard the name ever until the day I was arrested. Did you know Mady Clark? I never, never met her. Don't know who that is. Um, so let's talk about January 31st. Where were you that night? So January 31st, um, I believe that at the time that I got arrested, I really didn't know where I was at because of, you know, how long the time had elapsed. It, it had been eight months. I lived in the streets. So really, I would bounce from this house to that house. And um, so at that moment, I couldn't I, I couldn't tell. However, since I have, you know, had the opportunity to examine my phone records and kind of like remember back and just have enough time to just really sit back and, and, and think about it, I know that I was at the bottom line bar watching the Provo with a few other people, which one was Destiny Madrid, the girl that got arrested on my case. Um, my cousin, Larry Gilhouse was there. Eddie Flores, um, was there and there was other people that was in that bar, obviously. Um, you said the bottom line bar, where's that at exactly? That's located on Star Avenue and I believe it's on the corner of Star Avenue and Faulkner. Did you pay with a uh, credit card that night? No, I did not. Everything that I paid with was all cash. Um, I did have prepaid credit cards or debit cards. With, however, I did not use them. Very rarely did I use them. Do you know if anybody that was with you used a credit card? It's a possibility. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high possibility that my cousin Larry he had a legitimate job. He, he worked, you know, he didn't do the street life. You know, he actually had a, a, a good paying job. Um, Eddie, he's a, you know, a upstanding citizen. He had a good paying job. So he could have even used, you know, a credit card. Did you end up telling your attorneys that you were at a bar or did that never come up because you just didn't remember that? No, I, I did tell them that I was at the bottom line bar probably, 
my my trial was in July, I believe. So maybe a couple months before, maybe May, May, June area, you know, um, after I was going through discovery and really, like I said, looking into them phone records and sitting back thinking about where was I at that night. So the Pro Bowl started at seven o'clock that night. I'm guessing it would have been over at about 10, 15 or so. Uh, you got a phone call at 10, 27 from somebody. Do you know who that phone call was from? Yes, I have. Um, I have got that phone call. And um, I believe to believe that number was Destiny Madrid's phone number. But you said she was at the bar with you, right? Now, now let me let me say this. So I dropped my girlfriend off Starla at her mother's house because Children's Services took the kids and we were I wasn't allowed to be around them at the time because of the prostitution charge. Right. Um, so on the way to bottom line, there was text messages. I was texting throughout that whole day. I mean, from my phone records that I that I that I have in my possession, they start at 814. And there's text messages all the way through, let's say, hold on really fast. Do you have copies of the text messages, Sam? I don't have I don't have copies of the text messages. I want to know why they was not given in this report from the phone records. That's a very important issue. That will determine and prove my innocence. That is very 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 important. So 814 p.m. on this sheet, the first text message is recorded. The last text message recorded is 1143. So to be exact, there was 26 incoming text messages in that time and 20 outgoing text messages at that time. That is a whole conversation to two different people. Who are the two people? One was my first ex-wife's sister, um, Nicaela Garcia. And then the second one is to um, the number of who I believe it was Destiny Madrid's phone number. So Destiny wasn't at the bar with you the entire time? So the plan was for me to drop Starla off mm -hmm. so she can hang out with her kids and for me to really have free time to do whatever I wanted to do. What I chose to do was I chose to go pick up Destiny and spend time with Destiny. So on the way to picking Destiny up, I was texting her trying to make plans as to what we was going to do that night. Okay. Um, so I went and picked her up. Her grandmother lived on Thurston Street, the corner of Thurston and I believe it's Mason. So it was like maybe a block away from the bar. And then we went straight to the bottom line bar. Where did you go after the bar? Or how long were you at the bar, do you know? So to my recollection, I believe I was at the bar that entire night, at least until last call. And at last call was, I believe, at two o'clock in the morning. Um, after that, there had um, 
been conversation that we was going to try to go to another bar and, uh, you know, still try to get that last, that last beer in. And uh, I can't remember exactly where I went to specifically. However, through my phone records, it can show that I was nowhere other than the east side of Toledo throughout that whole night. So starting at like 2.30, between 2.30 and 3.30, there were six phone calls from you uh, trying to reach Cameo. I don't think he picked up on any of those. Why were you trying to call him? I was looking for a place to ultimately take this woman and have relations with. Um, she was what some people would call a mistress, you know, so my then girlfriend was pregnant with my son and I did not have any intentions on going back to her and sleep with her because she stayed at her mother's that night. So I had full reign to do whatever I wanted to do that night. So I was looking for a place other than having to spend money at a hotel for a couple hours because I was supposed to go pick her up in the morning that next morning. So you're trying to get a hold of Cameo, why? To go to his house, to, to sleep at his house, ultimately. I know he would not tell on me for um, taking another woman other than the woman that I was with, the mother of my child. So let me, let me ask you this, because I know this was a big part in the trial. I understand you were texting throughout, but they were focused on the phone calls. And so you got that phone call at about 1027 and you said that was, you, you believe that was destiny. And then there weren't any other calls until like 2.30. Hold on. No, that's wrong. That's, that, that is not accurate. Okay. I have the, I have the Toledo police, the Toledo police report right here that was admitted in my trial. That okay. was false. So to, okay. So I have, when it comes to phone calls, I have in total between a 10 hour and 46 minute window between 8.14 PM on the 30th and 7.03 AM on the 31st, there was 58 incoming calls and text messages, and there was 30 outgoing calls and text messages. There was 32 incoming calls that they didn't even speak about, and there was 10 outgoing calls. So actual phone calls, not text messages. Okay, so you said between the hours of 2.30 and 3.30? We talked to Cameo six times between, or you tried calling him six times between 2.30 and 3.30. But the, the records that I see are between 10.30 and 2.30 that you had no phone calls. That's inaccurate. I have, I have the, the, okay, so, so straight phone calls. I have a phone call to a unknown number at 12.03, AM incoming call that lasted 44 seconds. So you answered it. I okay. answered that phone call. And then between between 2:30 and you said the duration. 3 3:30, yeah, okay, cameos so, on there six times. Okay, so there was a there was a 178 second call at 301 which number I believe was my cousin Larry's after we left the bar we was going to go to eat at Denny's or we was going to go to freeway to grab a bite to eat that was the that was that phone call um 
But but you also had just said that you were going to get together with the mistress. Yes, she was with she was oh, with I us see. at the time. Okay. She was with me, and the woman that Larry was with, I believe her name was Teresa. Right. We planned on meeting, going to eat, and then going our separate ways. And I was looking for a place to lay down. Right. Yes. So Sam, do you have any explanation as to how a cigarette with your DNA got into the Straub house? I have no explanation. I know I did not place that there. Um, from the picture that I have seen and from the information that I heard in my trial, they did not smell any smoke in that house. That cigarette butt did not leave any marks on the floor. That, um, that cigarette butt was placed by that door so investigators can find it. I know that to be true. Is it unusual that yours and Cameo DNA would both be on that cigarette? Um, there did you, has did been you, times in the past that me and him have smoked after each other. So it's not unusual for that to happen, no. Okay. Now, another key point, I think, in the trial was when they played a, a jail call between you and uh, Stephen Petaway. And on that jail call, my understanding, and I just saw the article, I haven't actually heard the call. Um, you said something to the fact it was supposed to be you with me, but little bro had to step up. He didn't do it right, but he did it good enough. What was going on there? Okay. So that was just a piece of the phone call that they played during the course of my trial. And, um, that fit the, the narrative that they was trying to make out, okay? Um, the Hope phone call, Stephen was incarcerated um, for a while and me and him had engaged in, when I first started the prostitution, promoting prostitution, it was me and him that really had thought about it and really said, you know what, this is something that we're gonna do. And uh, he ended up going to jail on other charges. Now, after I was incarcerated, I was talking to him about, you know, some of the places that we went. Me and Camille had went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, on a trip strictly for business. Um, Sarah Rupert and his kids' his mother, Michelle Wainwright, was with us and Starla was with me. And I believe um, there was another girl with me, um, Marie Brewer. Um, that was what I was talking about. There was other occasions where me and Cameo went to um, promote prostitution in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, me and Cameo really wasn't, um, when Steven was out, me and Cameo, we hung out. That was, that's my brother. I consider him my brother. We always, all of us been close friends. However, when Steven's out, me and Steven are together a lot more. When he went to prison, you know, me and Cameo picked up and really hung out a lot more. So what did you mean specifically when you said Cameo didn't do it right? but he did it good enough. Okay, so when I say that he didn't do it right, but did it good enough is by the laws of promoting prostitution, in my eyes, he wasn't doing it the way that Stephen has done it in the past, but he was making money at doing it, okay? Um, I call him a petty pimp. Now, he really wasn't making uh, a lot of money. And when he did make money, he was spending it on the wrong things in my eyes. That's what I mean by that. So this conversation was about prostitution. Total prostitution. It was criminal activity. That's why I used another person's pin number when I called from the county jail. I was, let's make this clear. While I was in the county jail facing these murder charges, 
I still was engaging in criminal activity. I still wanted the drugs to be sold. I still wanted the money to come in from the prostitution. Hmm. Talk to me about Eric Yingling. Did you have a conversation with him at all related Absolutely to anything? Not. He had tried to approach me when I was in the county jail. Didn't know who he was. I was very skeptical about him first and foremost. Um, I have overheard another guy that was incarcerated that um, was a little bit older, pretty much kind of knew that he was somebody that had told previous in the past and um, kind of said, you know, hey, that guy snitches. So instantly my red flags had came up and I just stayed away. He did try to engage in conversation with me. So for me to say that he didn't would be me lying. He did. However, I did not have not one single conversation with him about anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Not the case, not my life, not who I was, what I was arrested for, nothing at all. So all the things that he talked about at, at trial, that was all known? I guess it was in newspapers, it was known information? Yes, um, to my knowledge, everything that he had brought up at trial had been either published in the newspaper or it was placed on search warrants and people could obtain that from public information. Even the Iraqi dinar information? Absolutely. They was talking about the Iraqi um, currency on a website called Mock Form. What, what's the website called, Sam? It's called Mock. I have it right here. I have the actual article. I had somebody print it off and send it to me. Mock Form? Yes. Yeah, I think I've seen that. So they were talking about that. So it's possible that he could have seen it there or somebody told him that information. Well, he admitted in my trial that his wife had researched my case. That was his specific testimony during direct examination in my trial. But then he got, he actually ended up getting freed from jail pretty quickly after he told the story about you. Is that correct? So this was the thing, to my understanding from the police reports and the uh, interviews that I have read, his first initial um, interview with the detectives was five days before Christmas. Okay. Um, he was already sentenced to 10 months in prison for not paying his child support. In them moments, he was really, really desperate to not go to prison because he had put people in prison before. It was Christmas time. He's been in the legal system pretty extensively. So he knew that if he went to the detectives with this case being so high profile and them being desperate, that 90% chance he would have of being able to get released and be with his family. So, so you believe that he probably thought that his life was in danger because he had snitched before and if he went to prison that he could possibly be in danger. Absolutely. So let's talk about when you got arrested. So did they interrogate you? Did they have a conversation with you? Did you lawyer up? What happened? So initially when Detective Kozak and Williams met the TPD officers, they switched cuffs. They took me into the detective bureau into an interrogation room. And I told them that I didn't want to talk, that I wanted to speak to my lawyer. Um, at that moment, they still was trying to um, talk about you know, what's your name and, you know, just um, what they called preliminary things. 
And uh, I answered them questions. Um, they asked me, did I know Johnny and Lisa? I specifically told them no. They asked me, have I ever been to Long Acre? And I specifically told them no. And at that moment, when they seen that I wasn't um, giving them the information that they was hoping for, then that's when Kozak said, then explain why is your DNA on my crime scene? At that moment, I had told him this conversation is over. I want to speak to my lawyer. So why didn't you just say, I have no idea what you're talking about? Why would, I mean, why did you at that point say this conversation is over? Well, I'm not, a, how, how do I say this? Um, I have been incarcerated before, right? And I know that murder cases are um, very serious. Um, this is a very serious crime. And I didn't know at that point if they was using that as a tactic to get me to talk or what the intention was. However, I knew that if I spoke to my attorneys, I would be able to find more information out that was more accurate to me and they would have my best interests. That's the reason why I did that. Did they ever offer to give you a polygraph? Never, not one time ever offered to give me a polygraph test. Did you ever offer to take a polygraph? That was never in no kind of way a discussion between me and my attorneys, uh, attorneys and prosecutors, um, attorneys and detective. Never, not one time did that come to my um, awareness. Because, you know, there are several people involved in this case that they gave polygraphs to. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would guess that that's probably got to, that's got to be a little upsetting that they offered all these other people uh, polygraphs and they didn't offer you one. Well, I'll say this. Uh, at the time, it does. It, 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 it's concerning that why would they ask all these other people, but not ask me. However, since um, I know the law about polygraphs and things of that nature, regardless if I passed it, they would say that it's not admissible in court. And if I don't pass it, they would try to use it to slander me in court. So, I mean, it's kind of like a catch 22 when it comes to polygraphs. Cameo took a polygraph test. Nobody speaks about that. Why? Because he's passed it. So yeah. it's. At what point? At what point did you know you're in trouble? As far as. Well, that. Oh man, they're gonna. They're they're trying to send me down for a, a murder, and I think they're really dead set on, you know, pinning this on me. At what point did you like? Because I'm guessing when you went in there, you're like, look, I had nothing to do with this. Um, at what point did you like, oh, wow, <laughs> they're really dead set on pinning this on me. So when they started certifying all these confidential informants, um, there was five confidential informants that were certified against me. What did they say? What did who say? I'm sorry. Well, the confidential informants, I mean, what, what was their testimony? I mean, what were they telling the police about you? Okay, so there's, to my knowledge, there's five. However, there are three that really um, kind of spoke in terms of, of me. All of them was while I was incarcerated in jail. Um, Travis Jones... He had been in jail, I believe for, I don't know exactly how many counts of robbery, but he had a X amount of robberies and he was trying to get his sentence reduced, which he did. He got his sentence reduced because he said that, I don't even remember exactly what he said uh, about me. I can get back to you on that. Um, Eric Yingling, 
he was the most uh, convincing one. That's why they put him on the stand. And uh, I can actually send you all the reports that have the narratives on what they said about me. Sure, that'd be great. And then there's another Ivory Carter. Um, he was another guy while I was incarcerated that um, had said things about me extensively. He had five interviews with the detectives. Um, Eric Ingling had five interviews with the detectives. And I don't know how many Travis had. However, all of them was trying to get either less time or let out. And every single one of them three had got either less time or let out behind this. Ivory Carter was involved in a uh, another cold case that I worked on when um, Kevin Carr was killed in Toledo. Ivory Carter was one of the people suspected in that case. So I'm, I'm familiar with that name. Um, Sam, let me ask you this. What do you want to say to the families of Lisa and Johnny? I would like them to know that I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, they only heard the narrative from the Lucas County prosecutors and I totally understand their pain and I feel their pain. I too am a victim, so I truly do understand what they're going through. However, I did not do this. I had no involvement in this case at all. And I pray that they seek justice for their family members. I pray that the truth is told one day that Lisa and Johnny's killers will be put behind bars where they deserve to be. So you believe that you were set up? I believe that I was set up. I believe that whoever done this placed that cigarette butt there to throw investigators off. And I believe that with the past record that I had and that promoting prostitution charge that I had, um, Detective Kozak arrested me on that case. All right. Do you, do you know why somebody would try to set you up? I don't know because there was DNA from me and Cameo on there. I don't know specifically if it was me or if it was Cameo. However, I do know this, people have known that I have um, been in trouble before with the law. So if they thought that, wow, oh, this guy put this cigarette butt out and this would be a good way of throwing the police off, um, he's already been in trouble before. So possibly his DNA is already in the system. Do you know who? might want to set you up? Do you have suspicions? Um, I really couldn't answer that question for you, no. Yeah. Let me ask you this, and we can, we can talk off the record about this if, if you want. Um, because I understand, obviously, I'm very sensitive to the fact that you have litigation and other stuff. But is there information that you know that, that could help me in going forward and trying to figure out who's behind this? And again, this can be off the record. Nothing you say here would ever be used on TV, but I'm just wondering if you can help me. I have no idea who done this. I have no idea. I can't tell you how many hours I have spent reading the paperwork that is in my case. I'm talking about hours and hours and hours of analyzing, rereading, analyzing, rereading. Um, I can come up with all these theories. I can come up with all these people who I believe that was involved, but that would be wrong of me because I have been wrongfully convicted and I don't wanna do this to nobody else. That's not who I am as a person. I truly couldn't do that to nobody. This was a brutal crime. It, it was brutal. I mean, to put a bag over someone's head, duct tape around their neck, torture them, 
is this something that you're capable of even doing? I never even contemplated even killing anybody, let alone killing these people in this manner. Um, it hurts me every day to know that the people that are responsible for this is outside still walking around your children, my children, um, my children's soon to be children, and there has been no answers. It's alarming to me that there was so many people fixated on this case from day one until my conviction, and then nobody else has publicly spoken about this. It is outrageous to me to know that it is only what they want to put out to get a conviction. And then when they want to suppress the rest, that's all that matters. It, it just it isn't right. Sam, do you believe that the police had tunnel vision once they kind of got your DNA and they were just hell bent on pinning this on you? I mean, do you think that they just got tunnel vision? They didn't look at anybody else? I mean, talk about Kozak. I mean, I believe uh, that the minute that Travis Jones and Eric Yingling Wing, and, and, and I've written something that I would like to read to you. So I was arrested on September 22nd, 2011 by the Lucas County Sheriff's Office. I sat in the Lucas County Jail and I was prosecuted by the Lucas County Prosecutor's Office. When I was arrested, Detective Kozak told me because I did not talk to him and I quote, he said this, I will make you look like a monster. His goal wasn't to seek truth, it was to get a conviction so the pressure would be relieved. There was so big of a spotlight on this case that it didn't matter how it had to be done. So when Travis Jones came forward to get a deal, they was open ears. When Eric England came forward to get out of being sent to prison after he was already sentenced, they became only more focused on me. And after Yingling comes Ivory Carter. And at last, Jason Westover. Now with this false information, the investigators chose to suppress all other evidence that points away from me instead of the ones that actually was guilty of this crime. Every false story every one of these guys told wasn't able to be corroborated. Every single thing that they told investigators that they would find evidence here or there, that I told them that evidence was here or there, they never was able to cooperate, not one thing. And investigators were so desperate, it didn't matter to them. That did not matter. From that point on, the goal wasn't to seek justice for Johnny and Lisa. It was just to convict Samuel Williams. There is many questions that need answers and I will do my best to tell the truth in everything that I know. I make it my mission to seek justice for Johnny, Lisa, and myself. And I mean that to you, Brian, while I sit here today, anything that I can possibly do to help, I'm willing to help. I don't know who done this. But I do know that there was so much pressure coming from media, family, um, people across the world that after my name was brought up and these confidential informants came forward, they didn't care about nothing else. There's other evidence that was um, in that house that wasn't tested. There's um, unknown male DNA on the victim's bodies that's on the cigarette butt in the sunroom with Sharita Crumbie's um, DNA. 
Nobody speaks about that. There's a lot of evidence, Brian, that, that hasn't been exposed. And I'm willing to work with you to expose that. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate what you just said there. Um, what went through your mind when you're sitting in, in the courtroom and I'm guessing in your mind, maybe you have an idea that this could go bad, but probably in your heart, you know that, hey, I didn't do this. They're ultimately they're going to find me not guilty. But what, what went through your mind when they read the guilty verdicts? I believe that one, um, it was a miscarriage of justice. I believe in that moment that because of the, the heinous crime that had occurred, the, the brutality that was put in place, I believe that the jury didn't care about certain facts. I believe that um, they believed Eric Yingling. And I'm gonna tell you this today as I sit here right now. Had I been a jury member on that jury, and had I not known the truth, I too probably would have believed Eric Yingling. That's how convincing he came across. Um, he is a master manipulator. He is a person that is only cared about himself and um, how he can get out of the things that he puts himself in. And um, I believed in the moments that I was gonna be sentenced to death for a crime that I didn't commit. Wow. And I know when you left the, the courtroom after, you know, you've been found guilty, you know, some of the people in the media, like, you know, he showed no remorse. He showed no emotion. But what were you feeling inside? And I think, I mean, why were, why were you trying to be maybe in that moment? It seemed like you're maybe you're trying to be tough and not show any emotion. Um, I don't see it in that light. I don't see it in the light of me trying to be tough. Obviously, I was trying to hold it together um, for my family's sake, um, for my sake. But I'll tell you what, the minute that I went back to my cell, it really hit me. I was numb at that moment. However, and it still hits me today, it hurts me to know that I may have to spend the rest of my life in prison for something that I didn't do. It, it does, it hurts me for that. However, I still have hope and I still believe that there is DNA that proves my innocence. And there is good people out there that is willing to help in find the justice for Lisa, Johnny and myself. Did you know Eric Taylor? I know him from being around the East Side. Um, it's not a character that I have been extensively hanging out with or was part of my inner circle. Um, I believe he may be been a friend of another one of my friends. Um, However, I don't know him um, specifically, no. So on the night of the murder, you had no communication with him? I haven't had no communication with that man in, I mean, years before that murder had occurred. And, and let me make this clear too. I haven't even had any conversation or um, interaction with Alexandria Puzno even months before the murder even occurred. I couldn't even, I think it was like maybe in 2008 around my felonious assault uh, charge that I got was like really the last time that I was like hanging around with her. Did, did Destiny, did she ever come and tell the, the police that, hey, Sam was with me that night? Yes, and the story that she gave them was that we went to a hotel and obviously there was eight months that had elapsed and there has been times where I did take her to a hotel. However, it wasn't that night. So they believed that she was lying 
and anything else that she said, it didn't matter to them. Because what she told them wasn't correct. You did not take her to a hotel that night. Not that night, no. Right. There was not no records from that exact night of us being in a hotel, no. Um, so I've got two more questions, and I know uh, Michelle is going to kick me off here. But uh, um, Hey, so why didn't you testify? Did you want to testify? Then ultimately, why didn't you testify? So I was opposed to testify. However, my counsel um, had advised against it um, due to some of the police reports that um, had been against me with um, relations to me and Victoria while we was going through our divorce. I'm not going to sit here and say that I didn't say harmful things to Victoria. I'm not going to sit here and try to make it out like um, I didn't do nothing wrong. We was going through a divorce. Um, we was in a custody battle over our first son. And uh, I did say hurtful things. To be exact on what I said, I couldn't tell you because it's been so long ago. But me and her talk on a day-to-day -day basis. And me and her have a friendship. And we try to co-parent as best as possible. And I'll tell you what. I didn't do no harm to that woman and I would never do no harm to that woman. So I'm guessing you have a lot of regrets in life. Um, you can say that I have made some mistakes, but I've learned from each and every one of the mistakes that I've made. What, what do you want people to know? I mean, so this is ultimately your story. What do you want people to know? I want people to know that I was wrongfully convicted of these murders and that ultimately there are people that are responsible for these murders that are still walking around amongst them each and every day thinking life goes on and everything is okay. However, one day they will be in the same position that I was once in, but the tables will be turned and they too will never have another opportunity to do this to nobody else.